Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank Santan for inviting me to speak on a little bit about the new glaucoma surgical device space and some real world experience of the pressure flow. I work with a number of companies, including Santan. While there are really four broad groups of new surgical innovation in glaucoma, the probably of relevance really are only two that relate to commercially available devices at present, i.e. the Schlems Canal space, which I've highlighted because it is the most crowded space, and the subconjunctival drainage space, which is of course of particular relevance to this talk. When I say the Schlems Canal space is crowded, you all be very aware of the very many new procedures in this space. And these divide roughly into the stenting procedures, such as the eye stent and the hydrus, and uh, these are elegant, they're minimally invasive, they're supported by randomized clinical trial efficacy thanks to their FDA process. And the cutting procedures, which really have a similar mechanism of action, it must be emphasized that these all do roughly the same thing. Cutting obviously involves a little more bleeding and can be a little more invasive because they tend to open the Schlems canal more extensively. Unfortunately, there aren't any randomized clinical trials comparing these with each other or with stenting at present. And finally, there's ab internal canaloplasty, which is, involves a little bit of cutting, but largely dilating of Schlem's canal. This is the hydrus, a three clock hour Schlem's canal stent. I highlight the hydrus simply as an example of the space. Why the hydrus in particular? Because it seems to have slightly greater efficacy in randomized clinical trials. In the Horizon study, which was a well-conducted randomized clinical trial of FACO hydrus versus FACO alone, at 12 months, you can see that 86% of FACO hydrus patients got a 20% IOP drop compared with 70% of FACO alone. And at two years, um, the hydrus had leveraged the proportion of patients getting a 20% IOP drop from 58% to 77%. So the hydrus, like the other Schlems Canal procedures, does improve the efficacy of pressure lowering after FACO. However, the efficacy of the Schlems Canal space is still modest and is perhaps not appropriate for people with very advanced glaucoma. Such patients require low target pressure because the risk division is high if any progression occurs. Remember in the advanced glaucoma intervention study 22 years ago, although uh, patients who didn't progress on average had a pressure of less than 18, the actual mean pressure that they achieved was not 17, it was 12. And even at 12, there was a risk of a three decibel progression over eight years of around 13%. Pressure was in the mid-teens, the risk was about 30%. And if the pressure was 20, the risk was about 70%. So the patient I showed before with very advanced glaucoma needs to have the pressure at a low level. So the subconjunctival space is the other important uh, MIGS-related space. And the Zen implant has been around for a number of years. Unfortunately, we don't have randomized clinical trial evidence of efficacy, but we know roughly how the Zen works. And the pressure flow microshunt, which is the newer procedure, uh, which is undergoing an FDA randomized clinical trial, we'll show in a moment. Uh, this is the device itself, which you will hear more of. And it produces these very diffuse posterior blebs. In this randomized clinical trial of pressure flow versus trabeculectomy, at, at one year, pressure flow achieved a pressure drop from 21 to 14 millimeters of mercury, which is pretty impressive. However, trabeculectomy achieved a pressure drop from 21 to 11. So while the pressure flow is very efficacious, trabeculectomy in patients with advanced glaucoma still achieves slightly lower pressures. To share some real world data, I'm going to show you some results from our International Glaucoma Surgery Registry. This is an online registry of all types of glaucoma surgery that's free to use and you can get your own login at either the European Glaucoma Society website eugs.org or at our own website. The purpose of this registry is a personal surgical audit for individual surgeons uh, first and foremost. 
but it also has the potential to provide a large data set for rough comparison of outcomes across all types of glaucoma surgery and to provide individual companies with new device data for regulatory and other purposes. And finally, we hope that in the long term, this will uh, allow us to produce patient reported feedback on all types of glaucoma surgery. In three years, we have accumulated roughly 4,100 uh, glaucoma procedures of which 326 were pressure flow, and you can see there were 47 pressure flow revisions. Most pressure flows are implanted with mitomycin C, and you can see in clinical practice here that most patients are having 0 0.4, 0 0.5 milligrams per mil of mitomycin C, quite high doses. Most uh, patients are getting these on sponges for applied for two to three minutes. Interestingly, we had an exactly 50-50 male-female split, but I promise we didn't fiddle the data for this. Almost 70% of patients were Caucasian, 15% Asian, and almost 11% uh, Afro-Caribbean. Only 37% were pseudophagic. In fact, most patients were phagic at the time of surgery. And only 11% had concurrent cataract surgery, the majority are standalone. Uh, cases in fakey guys. Not surprisingly, the vast majority were primary open angle glaucoma, although it's interesting that 30% were secondary open angle glaucoma, though most of these are, are likely to be pigment dispersion or exfoliation rather than more severe secondary open angle glaucomas. Surprisingly, though, quite a few patients did have, have previous surgery, and it's not my clinical practice to perform a microshunt after trabeculectomy, but clearly other surgeons are doing this. In general, I tend to avoid combining pressure flow with cataract surgery because it does seem to be a little less effective, as is trabeculectomy, as are tube implants. And I do tend to reserve pressure flow for eyes with virgin conjunctiva because then you've got the best chance of success. Perhaps not surprisingly, 24% were on acetazolamide tablets at the time of surgery, but the vast majority were not. Most patients were on quite substantial amount of topical medications between three and four drugs. And here are the intraocular pressure profiles over the follow-up period. And you can see the baseline was around 23 millimeters of mercury. And by two to three years, um, the pressures were around 14 to 14 and a half millimeters of mercury, although you can see that although the pressure drifts up at three to four years, there are very few patients that actual follow-up period. The majority uh, are between a year and uh, two years, where the pressures are around 14, which is very much in keeping with the uh, pivotal study. You can see the number of topical medication has dropped quite dramatically. And even at uh, the two to three year level, there's patients are on average only on one drug. Visual acuity is roughly stable. Again, at uh, 18 months to two years, visual acuity is absolutely stable. Uh, beyond two years, there are very few patients with which to make a judgment. Postoperative complications were few. We recorded roughly 15% complications. Uh, a small number had choroidal effusion. There's certainly, you do get some hypotony. In most cases, it's not severe. And you do get some hyphemas simply because you're making a, a needle incision into the eye. It's worth pointing out that because it's a very small device, you can get a device obstruction if it's too close to iris. And some encapsulate, although I would debate whether or not this should be classified as a complication. Encapsulation really isn't a complication. 70% of patients had no postoperative inter intervention. Of the 30% that did have a postoperative intervention, the majority were an increase in the topical glaucoma medication or recommencement of topical glaucoma me medication. 5-FU injections. You will see that in contrast to uh, Zen implantation, very few 
had needling and personally I don't like to needle in, uh, post-operatively as I feel it is uh, very imprecise. What about success rates? Well, 21 or less, 93% of patients achieved that, but then the starting pressure was 22 to 23, so perhaps not surprising. However, three quarters of patients got to 18 or less, two thirds got to 15 or less, which is more impressive. And quite a substantial proportion still got to below 13, i.e. 12 minutes of mercury or less. At baseline, 97% were on medication. We did have a small number who wanted surgery so they didn't have to have medication. At three months, 80% were medication free. At six months, 77% medication free. And at a year, almost two thirds were medication free, which I think is quite impressive. Was there a further procedure? Yes, in 13% of cases, no in 86%. Further procedures included these, and you see there's some duplicates. Because of the change in name from InFocus to Preserflow, the uh, registry has recorded some of these procedures twice. How much mitomycin should we be using? In the FDA study, 0.2 milligrams per mil was used on sponges. In other studies, it's been 0.4 milligrams per mil. In real life, people use a, a wide range from 0.1 to 0.5 and we've divided the results into those from the low doses and the high doses the high doses being 0.4 to 0.5 milligrams per mil and you can see that if you're looking for a target pressure of 21 or 18 or less there isn't actually much difference in success however when you look for lower target pressures of 15 millimeters of mercury or less or 12 millimeters of mercury or less higher doses do seem to leverage the efficacy. Here, for a pressure of 15 or less, you're getting 43% complete success with a low dose, but it goes up to 51% with a high dose. On the other hand, for 12 millimeters of mercury or less, the success rate goes from 26% to 35%, and overall the failure rate is lower for higher doses. Here's a case example, 57 year old white American male with primary open angle glaucoma and previous LASIK referred to me in 2014 with pressures of 16 in the right, 13 in the left on COSOP to both eyes. He was originally myopic, we're not sure to what degree, but he does have thin central corneas. His visual fields were like this at presentation. Four years later, they had definitely progressed. Presentation years later. So in summary this is a 57 year old white American male with thin corneas following LASIK POAG for nine years originally myopic clearly progressing with pressures of 11 and 13 on four drugs and he needs surgery. My feeling is he needs no target pressures. He's offered trabeculectomy with myelomycin C versus Preserflow. The patient chose Preserflow even though I felt that probably a trabeculectomy might be the better option. He underwent a left pressure flow with 0.4 milligrams per mil of myelomycin C on 4th of July 2018. Three weeks after surgery, the pressure was 11, and we proceeded with the right eye on the 1st of August. On the 28th of August, the pressure was 10 in both eyes with no medication, and a year and three months later, the pressure was 5 in the right and 10 in the left, but only on COSOPT in the left. And these are the pressure profiles from the registry. And the graphs above show how his pressure behaved after surgery with the blue lines being the preoperative pressure, the green line being the pressure after surgery, the black line being the medication before surgery and the orange line being the medication after surgery. And the left eye is on the left and the right eye is on the right. He had a completely uneventful post-operative course, other than the additional topical medication on the left. Excellent diffuse blebs, no post-operative morbidity, no dysesthesia, but it's too early to have visual field results to ascertain stability. And given that his pressure at baseline was low, 
with thin corneas, he does need low long-term pressures. So while it's not yet clear if this patient is out of the woods, pressure flow does offer a good option in many patients. And we will hear more of this in future. Thank you very much for your attention, ladies and gentlemen.